All right, well, we're there. Matthew chapter number 46. Look down at verse number 41. We're going to be in uh, Matthew 26, the whole sermon tonight, so keep your place there. We'll be moving around a lot, but we will always be coming back to Matthew 26. So look down there at verse number 41. Notice we see a well-known phrase that Jesus says a lot in this chapter, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So like I said, this is a well-known verse. A lot of people are familiar with this phrase, watch and pray. So uh, we just see a random, just reading this verse alone can kind of be a little confusing, not knowing where we are. So look at verse 36. I just kind of want to read our little story we're in here. Verse 36 kind of gives us the context. It says, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane. So Jesus has just had the Lord's Supper. He has revealed that Judas is the one who will betray him. And he's going into the garden of Gethsemane with his disciples. And saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. So he's going into the garden. He takes Peter, James, and John with him. And a lot of times we'll see this, where Jesus just takes Peter, James, and John with him. If you remember the Mount of Transfiguration, it's the same thing. Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him. Uh, verse 38, Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little further, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples, Peter, James, and John, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What, could he not watch with me one hour? So here he, Jesus is just about to die for the sins of the whole world. He's just about to die for the sins of these three men uh, as among the, the entire world. And all he asked them is he said, Can you just pray with me? He said, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Can you just pray with me? Can you watch with me? And he comes back and they're asleep. And then here we have the, our verse tonight, watch and pray. The enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. The title of the sermon tonight is Watch and Pray While You Still Can. Watch and pray while you still can. And I'd like to give us three lessons tonight from Matthew chapter 26 on what it means to watch and pray. When he said watch and pray, what was he talking about? What does it mean to watch and pray? When he said watch it with me, watch with me, watch and pray, what was he telling them to do? First thing tonight is to watch and pray. We must pray the right way. We must pray the right way. I want you to notice that Jesus said, watch with me. This means that Jesus was watching himself. So what greater example of someone to learn how to watch and pray than from Jesus himself, right? Amen. So I want you to notice that in this story, the main thing that we see about Jesus is how he prayed. I want you to look in verse 39. I'd like to give you real quick two ways to pray the right way. Jesus didn't just pray any way. There was a certain way he prayed. There were certain ways he told us to pray. And when we look at verse 39, let's look at the first way to pray the right way. Verse 39, And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. The first way we can pray the right way tonight is put God's will before yours. Put God's will before yours. Turn to Matthew 6, 9. Matthew 6, 9. While you're turning there, I'm going to read you a parallel passage, Luke 22, 42, where it says, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. And nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. We need to pray. When we pray, we need to make sure we put God's will before ours. Now, it doesn't mean we can't ask God for what we want. We can't put our will in there. But we have to put God's will first. Because Jesus, he prayed for what he desired. He didn't want to go through what he was going to go through. And he prayed. He said, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but, but thine be done. And this is a common theme we see with Christ. It's not just in the Garden of the Gethsemane we see it. If you're there in Matthew 6, 9, the Bible says, this is what Jesus said, After this manner, therefore pray ye. So he's teaching the disciples how to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now, I want you to notice in this prayer, you know, when he teaches his disciples to pray, part of that prayer is asking, you know, for our daily bread, asking for what we need, but he makes sure to say, thy will be done. 
And because, you know, God knows what, what's best for us more than we know, right? So even from a selfish perspective, it's best to pray for God's will. If you uh, turn to Jeremiah 29, 11, because if we're honest with ourselves, this is how we like to pray. My will, my will, my will, my will, my will. And I want it right now, and that's what I want. But God knows more than, better than we do, right? We'd be better off if we just prayed for God's will because he knows best. For there in Jeremiah 29, 11, the Bible says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Look, God knows the plan for your life. He knows what's best for your life. You say, well, how do, I get, how do I get that expected end? How do I get uh, that plan God has for my life? Verse 12, and Then shall he call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. Sometimes we complain and say, Oh, God's not answering my prayer. God's not answering my prayer. Well, do you pray? Do you pray about it? Do you put God's will before yours? Because a lot of times we have a problem where we have something we want to be fixed and we pray to God to help us but we just pray for what we want we pray for what we want whereas in reality God has something that's much better for our lives Amen. right Amen. and the ironic thing it, it's it's ironic because the what's best for us is what God wants sometimes we think that we know the answer to everything we know what is the best plan for our lives but really what God knows what the best plan for our lives is turn to Proverbs 3 5 Proverbs 3, 5. I mean, just with me personally, some of the best prayers I've had answered are when I don't know what to do and I just ask God to take care of it. I just ask for God's will. And that's how it is with all of us. Proverbs 3, 5. It's a familiar verse. Proverbs 3, verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. When, even when we pray, this verse right here is a great pattern. We're supposed to trust God, right? And sometimes it's hard. Sometimes we want, we, we have a problem, right? We have a problem or we have something we're praying about and we have set in our minds the way that we think it should be answered. And we have a plan and we have, oh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be fixed this way and this way and this way. And when we pray, what we're really doing is just asking God that he solves it our way, right? But this is why we need to put God's will before ours because it's a safeguard behind it that, you know, God's will, just in case the way we're praying, just, just in case, which is a lot, the way we think we have it figured out, just in case that's the wrong way, God's will, if we put God's will before ours, he will take care of it. Verse 6, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Verse number 7 kind of follows this up. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. This is just a good, uh, this verse can apply a lot to praying because when we're praying, it's, it's all about being not wise in our own eyes, right? Putting God's will before ours. So we're talking about how to watch and pray. First I said to watch and pray, we must pray the right way. And we're looking at these two ways, right, to pray the right way. The first way is put God's will before ours. The second way tonight is we need to spend time in prayer. We need to spend time in prayer. Look at back at Matthew 26. Matthew 26, 39. Verse 39, the Bible says, And he went a little further and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. So he's in the garden praying. We just looked at that, how he put God's will before his. But notice verse number 40. I think this is interesting. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep. And saith unto Peter, What, could he not watch with me? Notice this, one hour. So he says to the disciples, Watch with me. He goes and he prays and he comes back. And he says, Couldn't you watch with me one hour? Jesus was praying for one hour. Have you ever spent an hour straight in prayer? Have you ever spent an hour praying to God for something? Look, there is serious power in spending, not just praying in general, but just spending time in prayer. You know, a lot of us, you know, our idea of prayer is the 10-second prayer we rattle off as quick as we can before we eat, right? But you know what you notice? Jesus, he spent time in prayer. It wasn't just something he did for five minutes. He didn't do just for 10 minutes. He spent time in prayer. This morning we sang hymn number 301, Sweet Hour of Prayer, right? This, that idea of spending an hour in prayer 
This is where it came from. It came from this idea of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane spending an hour straight in prayer. Amen. Right? Turn to Psalm 55, 16. Psalm 55, 16. Honestly, I think that prayer is probably the most underestimated weapon we have in the Christian life, Amen. right? Yeah. One example I thought is um, sometimes you'd see, if you're out in a mall somewhere, you'll see a fire extinguisher, and it's, you know, in that little glass box, right, with a little handle. It says, you know, break in case of emergency, right? That's how Christians think prayer is. They think it's just this thing when everything has gone wrong, when everything else has failed, if you have to, break in case of emergency, right? Is that what prayer is? Right? And I think God will honor our prayer more if we spend time in prayer all the time, not just when we really need it. Right? Psalm 55, 16. As for me, I will call upon God. So we're talking about praying here. And the Lord shall save me. Notice verse 17. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. That's a lot of time in prayer. Can you say that you've always prayed evening and morning and noon? I know I can't. We need to be, make, make sure that we're not just praying and we're not just praying for God's will, but we need to be spending time in prayer, right? There's, there's a special power in spending time in prayer. And you say, what's the result of that? Verse 18, He hath delivered my soul in peace from the battle that was against me, for there were many with me. You say, I'm going through a battle right now. I'm going through some, some, some hard times right now. Hey, evening and morning and at noon, pray. Cry aloud. And the result, you have delivered my soul in peace. You know, I think a lot of people, you know, you hear a lot of people say, oh, you know, they won't say it, but you no know, one will say prayer doesn't work. But people almost have this idea that prayer really doesn't work. It's just kind of something we're supposed to do. I think, I do honestly think that the reason people think that is most people don't pray. Most people don't spend time in prayer every single day. Uh, you don't have to turn there, but Psalm 109 verse 4 says, For my love there are my adversaries, but I give myself unto prayer. Do you give yourself unto prayer? I know I always don't. It's something I need to work on myself. It's, it's hard, but we need to train ourselves to consistently spend time in prayer. This morning, uh, my dad talked about consistency, right? If you want to spend time in prayer, it has to be consistent. You have to set a time. You have to set, set a place, or it's not going to happen, right? Yes. Same thing with Bible reading. If you don't set a time, you don't set a place, it, you know, it, you'll look back and it's been weeks since you've done it, right? We ought to give ourselves unto prayer. Here's how I look at it. I don't want to get to heaven and, and have Jesus show me, hey, you know, you know that battle you went through there and that, that hard time you went through there and, you know, you went through this and you went through that and this was really hard. You didn't have to go through that. I, I would have helped you and, you know, you didn't have to go through this and I could have helped you with this and I could have given you this and I could have blessed you with this, but you just never asked for it, yeah. right? And a lot of times, we're, you know, we just rattle off a 10-second prayer. I'm like, I asked for it. You know, I, I prayed. We need to spend time in prayer, right? Jesus prayed for an hour straight in prayer. That's, that's no joke, right? Uh, tonight, after the sermon, we're going to sing What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Um, I picked that song. kind of goes along with uh, this idea here. I'm going to read you the lyrics to the first line. It says, What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear, what a privilege to carry. Do you, do you look at prayer like a privilege? Right? And what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. And, and I love this next line because this is so true. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. See, why do I bear all this pain and this needless pain? And how, why do I forfeit all this peace? All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. There's a lot of pain that we go through. There's a lot of suffering we can go through. And a lot of it we're just going to go through anyway. But I think a lot of it, is, it, it doesn't need to be that bad, but it's because we just don't pray. Amen. Right? Amen. Who knows what blessings and what needless pain you're bearing just because you don't pray. Or you don't spend time in prayer. You don't pray for God's will. So just to recap, you know, how do we pray the right way? I think we, the two things we see from this story are we need to pray for God's will. Even Jesus Christ himself, God in the flesh, put God's will before his, and he spent an hour straight in prayer. So first tonight, we're talking about how to watch and pray, right? First tonight, I said to watch and pray, we must pray the right way. Second tonight, to watch and pray, we must deny the flesh. Uh, look at, we're there in Matthew 26. Look down at verse 41. Matthew 26, 41. 
There's our verse. He says, watch and pray. Ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Turn to Romans 7.17. 7, Romans 7.17. 7, While you're turning there, I want to read to you Galatians 5.16. It says, This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. So in Galatians we see, just like we're going to see here in Romans, the idea of this battle between our spirit and our flesh, right? You're saved, so you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, but you're battling the flesh, right? You still have that sinful nature, right? When you got saved, your spirit was saved, but your flesh was not, yeah. right? So we still are stuck with this flesh. So we're going to need to learn how to deal with it. You're there in Romans 7, 17. The context is we're talking about this battle between the spirit and the flesh. Verse 17 says, Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in, that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. And then verse 19, we're going to spend a little bit in this verse here. It says, For the good that I would, I do not. So this, this is a verse a lot of times, you know, you're reading through the Bible, you know, you have your amount of chapters you're trying to get through in a day. Sometimes we can tend just to zip through real fast. But I want you to just to stop and think about what this verse is saying. For the good that I would, I do not. So he's saying the good that I want to do, I don't do, but the evil which I would not, the evil that I don't want to do, that I do. And this is just a great verse that talks about this battle between the flesh and the spirit. Verse 20, Now if I do that what I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So when we're talking about the flesh, and how do we deny the flesh, right? How do we deny the flesh? Je you know, the, Jesus said that the problem with the disciples when they fell asleep was their flesh, right? They were giving into their flesh. So I want to give us two ways the flesh will stop us from serving God, right? When the two ways the flesh will keep us between us and God's will. The first thing, in Romans, look at verse 19 there. It, is, it will keep us from doing what is good. For the good that I would, I do not. For the good, the, the good things I want to do, the good things I know I should do, I don't do. The flesh will keep you from doing that which is good. Turn to Galatians 5.17. Galatians 5.17. The Bible says in Galatians 5.17, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit. We already, I already read this part and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary, the one to the other. Notice this, what's the effect of the flesh? So that you cannot do the things that you would. So we, sometimes we want to serve God, we want to do what, to, what is right, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh keeps us from doing what we should do, right? Look, at, skip down to verse 23. Say, what's, what's, the, what's the flesh keeping me from doing? How, what is the flesh stopping me from doing. The good that I would, what is that? What's it stopping me from doing? Verse 23, but the fruit of the Spirit. See the, see the compare and contrast here? It's the flesh, the Spirit, the flesh, the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. This is what the flesh is keeping you from doing. So here's what this means. If you're in the flesh, you won't have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. You see, you see, see how this works? If, you, if you're in the flesh, what the flesh will do, if you let the flesh control you, it will keep you from doing what God wants you to do. It will keep you from doing what is good. Amen. All right. When the Bible says, you say, what's an example? Well, here's, here, it's real simple. When the Bible says to do something and you don't want to, it's because you're in the flesh, right? Here's some examples I think you know, it, because picture this, it, it's, there's, a, there's a war going on in your flesh, right? And when the Bible says to do something, right, whatever it is, thou shalt this, do this, do this. When the Bible tells you as a saved Christian to do something and you don't, congratulations, you just got whooped by your flesh. Yeah. That's how it works, right? And here's some examples I think this applies to all of us, right? You wake up in the morning, man, I don't want to read my Bible right now. It's four in the morning. I don't want to read my Bible right now. I want to go back to bed. Flesh wins. Yeah, I, I know this is my prayer time. I know this is the only time I have to do it. But I have, I have, like, have a million other things to do. I'll come back to that later. Flesh wins. I know the Bible says fill in the blank. But insert excuse here. Flesh wins. That's how that works, right? 
This happens to all of us. And just back to what Jesus said, he said, your spirit, your spirit is willing. The, the spirit wants to serve God. If you're saved, there's something inside of you that wants to serve God, that wants to do what is right, that wants to do God's will. You read something in the Bible and you want to do it, but the flesh is weak. But the flesh does not want to. And we need to realize that if we're going to serve God, we need to deny the flesh. And if we're going to deny the flesh, we need to know what it's going to do to us, right? We need to be able to watch for, you know, when we wake up in the morning, we don't want to read or our Bibles or pray. And, and we have that temptation not to. We need to realize that's the flesh, yeah. right? I'm going to deny the flesh. We need to realize what is the flesh. But the second thing the flesh will do to us, it will make us do what, it, what is wrong, right? That's the other part of uh, Romans uh, 7.19, right? It, sure, it's going to keep you from doing what is good, but it's also going to make you do that which is wrong, right? Galatians 5.17, if you're there, the Bible says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But I want you to notice now, it says, But if you light of the spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh. There's that compare and contrast again. you got the spirit and you got the flesh, right? Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. That's a lot more than the fruits of the Spirit, right? It's, so it, which makes sense, right? Because the theme is always it's, it's harder to do that which is good, right? But I want you to notice that there not, there's not just works of the Spirit that the flesh will keep you from doing. There's also works of the flesh that you will do if you're in the flesh, right? Uh, every, it says there, although which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So not only will being in the flesh keep you from doing what is good, but it'll make you do what is wrong. Uh, you don't turn there, but Romans 8, 7 says, because the carnal mind, right, it's talking about the flesh, the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. He's saying the flesh, if you have the carnal mind, it, you, you can't even serve God. It's impossible. You have to deny the flesh. Verse 8, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If you are in the flesh, you can't please God. So we need to learn how to deny it. Turn to 2 Peter 2.9. 2 Peter 2.9. 2 Peter 2 is um, it's that um, well-known chapter. It's a parallel of Jude talking about reprobates. Right? And there's a lesson here from reprobates I want to give you to kind of teach us this idea, right? How the flesh is going to make us sin. The flesh is going to make us do that which is wrong. I want to teach you something or show you something from 2 Peter 2 that will illustrate that. Uh, verse 9, 2 Peter 2, 9, the Bible says, And the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust into the day of judgment to be punished. So just keep in mind as we're going in to this, we're not talking about the unsaved, we're not talking about... Uh, save people, we're talking about reprobates. But chiefly, them that walk after the flesh. Well, you notice that when we're talking about reprobates, what's the main thing that says they do? They walk after the flesh, yeah. right? In the lust of uncleanness and despised government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil dignities. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. But these, as natural brute beasts, making to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. So, just a quick thought on reprobates. So, have you ever wondered what makes a reprobate so evil? You say, well, they have no conscience. Right, but have you ever thought, why being without a conscience, why does that make you so evil? Well, here's the thing. So, you're saved tonight, right? You're saved. You have the flesh in you. You have a conscience that you've always had and you have the Holy Spirit, right? Someone out there who's not saved, they have the flesh, but they have their conscience. So they still have something, right? They don't have the Holy Spirit because they're not saved, but they at least have something standing between th stopping the flesh from taking complete control over them, right? A reprobate, do they have the Holy Spirit? No. Do they have the conscience? So what are we left with? The flesh. A reprobate is 100% flesh. 
That's why they're so evil. There's no conscience. There is no Holy Spirit. There is nothing keeping their flesh. Their flesh has, has free, free, free run. The flesh can do whatever it wants. And that's why it says they walk in the flesh. So you say, well, I'm saved. I'm never going to be a reprobate, so how in the world does this apply to me? Well, we look at the, what's the effect. When we have uh, something that is 100% flesh, what's the effect? Verse 14. Having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin. Beguiling unstable souls and heart, they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. The effect of being 100% flesh is that you cannot cease from sin. That's, they're, they're in sin. So you say, how can I apply this to me? Well, that means, now obviously you're saved, so you're not 100% flesh, but you have the flesh to a degree, and what the effect of the flesh is, is it will make you sin. Yeah. Right? So we need to watch for that. We need to, because look, we're saved, we have the Holy Spirit, but it means that, we, that the effect of the flesh is sin. So we need to watch out for that, right? This is why, remember we read that verse, says, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Here's why, that's why. Because it's going to keep you from doing what is good. It's going to keep you from serving God. It's going to keep you from doing the fruits of the Spirit. But not only that, but it will lead you into sin. Right? It will, it will make you do the works of the flesh. Right? So we need to... Uh, understand this if we're going to die in the flesh. So first tonight, I said to watch and pray, we must pray the right way, right? And we looked at, okay, that involves praying for God's will, putting God's will before ours. That involves spending time in prayer, right? Not just praying, but spending time in prayer. And second, we said to watch and pray, we must, we must deny the flesh, right? And we looked at the two effects that the flesh has on us. It's going to make us do that which is wrong, and it's going to keep us from doing good. Third tonight, to watch and pray, we must always be ready. For there, Matthew 26, look at verse 47. Matthew 26, 47. Verse 47 says, And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, remember that guy? One of the twelve came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Skip down to verse 46 for sake of time. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Notice the last part of this verse. It's really a sad part of the verse. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. And so we see here, Jesus he tells them to watch and pray. They keep falling asleep. They keep falling asleep. And finally, it's too late, right? They come with the, the multitude comes with swords. And it says, all the disciples forsook him and fled. You know, you read this, and what I always thought is like, man, that was quick. You know, it's like, they're gone, right? Multitude comes, they're gone, right? Not even a uh, second thought. But I want you to notice, uh, turn to Luke twenty two thirty one. Luke twenty two thirty one. I want you to notice that the disciples said otherwise. If you, you don't have to turn there, you're turning to Luke 22. But earlier in our chapter, if you'll remember, um, when Brother Phil read, it mentioned that Peter said that he wouldn't betray him, right? And it says, likewise, also said all the disciples. So all the disciples had said that they weren't going to betray Jesus. And I don't think they were just saying this. I think they genuinely thought that they were ready or they weren't going to do this. They weren't going to betray him. They're, you're there in Luke twenty two thirty one. The Bible says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Look, tonight we're in a Bible-believing church that has the right gospel. Not only does it have the right gospel, but it's doing something about it. Amen. It's preaching the gospel. It's fulfilling all three parts of the Great Commission. Amen. Satan wants all of you tonight. Yeah. He wants me. He wants you. Just like the Lord said to Peter, he said, Satan hath desired to have you. Satan wants you, and he wants you bad. Verse 32, But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Look at verse 33, and he said, this is Peter, and he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt deny, shall, thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. So in verse 33, Peter claimed to be ready, right? This is what the, he said earlier in Matthew 26. He said, I am ready, I'm ready to go to prison, I'm ready to die for the cause of Christ. He said he was ready, and like I said, I don't think they were just saying this, because it says all the disciples said likewise. I think they actually 
could have convinced themselves that they were ready to go through whatever was coming, right? But turns out he wasn't, right? You know the rest of the story. He, all the disciples forsook him and fled. But even later in the story, he denies three times that he knew Christ, right? He thought he was ready, but he wasn't. Are we? Right? We need to ask ourselves, am I ready for whatever happens? And you say, well, why would you go to this verse? Because other verses, there's other places in the Bible where men of God say that they were ready to go through persecution, and they were, and they did, and they faithfully served God. You say, well, why would you go to a story about someone who said they were, but they weren't ready, who ended up betraying Christ in the end? That's not very inspirational, right? Why would you go there? Well, here's why. Because what, what it shows us is that just, because, just saying you're ready to suffer and just saying that you're going to stick with it doesn't mean you actually will, right? If you're, uh, you don't have to turn there, but Acts 21.1 says, Then Paul answered. So now we're talking about Paul. What mean ye to weep and break mine heart? For I am ready, same phrase, not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul said he was ready, but the difference being that he actually was. If you actually read the rest of the book of Acts, he goes and he was... He was beaten by the Jews more, and he, you know the story. He ends up in Rome. He actually was ready to be bound. He actually was ready to die. I, I personally believe he, he did end up dying for the name of Christ. That's not in the Bible. We don't know that for sure. But even from what the Bible tells us, he was ready to suffer persecution, right? Peter said he was, but he wasn't, right? And obviously, Peter ended up doing great things, greater things for God than any of us probably will, right? But at this time, he thought he was, but he wasn't, right? Uh, if you're there in, um, you don't have to turn there, but did I tell you to turn to Matthew 13? Turn to Matthew 13. Matthew 13, 20. Matthew 13, 20. We're in Matthew 13, 20. We're talking about the parable of the sower. So Jesus just uh, told the parable of the sower, and now he's explaining it to his disciples. A lot of times he would tell a parable, and then his disciples would come to him after, because there were certain people he did not want to hear, he didn't want him to understand. So his disciples would come to him after, and they'd ask him to explain the parable. This is what Jesus is doing now. He's explaining the parable of the sower. Verse 20, But he that received the word in stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. So he's saying, this person he's talking about is a say believer, they've received the word, yet hath he not Yet hath he not root in himself, but endureth for, notice this, a while. For when tribulation or persecution. So we're not just talking about persecution here. The definition of tribulation is a cause of great uh, suffering or trouble. right? So it's not just persecution. Anything that is hard for you or suffering or, or, perse or persecution is, is one of them. But he's talking. he says, tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word. By and by he is offended. He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, a saved person, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. So he says tribulation or persecution. So he's not just talking about being per That's what we think of initially, right? That's what it was in Peter's case, right? It was persecution. But just in general, when the Christian life gets hard, are you going to stick with it? Because it's going to get hard eventually, right? One way or another, it's going to get hard, right? So are you going to stick with it when it does, right? Peter thought he would. He didn't, right? So we need to really just count the costs in our own minds and look at it and think about that. Because look, Satan wants nothing more than to choke you out spiritually, right? That's why what he said with the, in the parable how it, 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 the words choked, right? Satan wants to choke you out because here's the thing. You're saved. Right? You're never going to lose your salvation. Satan knows that. But do you know what he can do? Is he can stop you from getting other people saved. He can, th think about it. He can literally, you are saved and he cannot do anything to change that. But Satan can literally send hundreds of people to hell just by choking you out spiritually. And, and making you, stopping you from being fruitful spiritually. He can't take your salvation, but he will stop you from serving God, right? And as far as the per persecution in particular, you know, even if it's something as silly as people being offended by our standards, we're not in the great tribulation right now, right? But there's just little things, right? Like maybe at work, right? At work, it, any, you, I'm sure many of you know this, but you go to work and it doesn't take very long for people to notice that you don't swear and you don't listen to their music and you, you live totally different from the way they live. 
And if you're anything like me, people start asking you questions, right? People start asking, like, people will ask, uh, what kind of music do you listen to? Uh, 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 I don't know. Uh, what kind of music do you listen to? Hymns? This, this is the conversation I have with numerous people. Hymns? What's a hymns? <laughs> hymns, you know? You ever been to church? Hymns? You know? And then, like, they still don't know, but they just, like, it's awkward, so they just, oh, okay. You know, they still don't know what a hymns is, but they just, oh, okay, all right, you know? No, you, you, look, Stan, do you, do you believe, just let's just take the music as an example. Do you believe that the hymns that we sing in this hymn book, do you believe that this is the music we should be listening to? Amen. Do you? Amen. So when people ask you, what do you listen to? Do you, do you believe it? Then tell them. Stand up, because look, the world is, is open with what they believe. The world will openly, and they don't even, they're not even ashamed of it. It's not, you know, they don't even know that you would be offended by it. They're openly talking about the lifestyle they're living. You know, they're openly talking about the things they're going to do that weekend. They're openly talking about the sin that they're going to live in. And then, what kind of music do you listen to? Uh, you see how this works? Yeah. Look, you don't need to be a jerk about it, because I think a lot of people just, like, go and they just force everything they believe on people they work with. You don't need to be a jerk about it, but stand up for what you believe. Do you, believe, do you believe what's in here or not? There was a guy I worked with in Sacramento, and he was an atheist, and, and he asked me, he said, well, you know, what about all these people from all these other religions, you know, like Buddhists and Muslims who are good people? You know, you think that they're going to go to hell? You know? Well, well, you know, the... the you know, God, want, God loves them, and he, want, he died for them too, and he wants them to be saved. But it, yeah, if they don't believe in Jesus, they will go to hell. That's okay. what the Bible teaches. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh into the Father but by me. Okay. Right? Like I said, you know, you don't need to take it to an extreme where you're a jerk about it. Here's my rule at work. Like, just with me personally, I don't tell people what I believe. I don't tell people where I go to church. But when people ask me, which they do, I'll tell them right away. I'm not ashamed of what I believe. Are you ashamed of what you believe? Amen. You know, we come to church and we're not ashamed of what we believe. We're on this soul winning hype and we're on, you know, or this, this hype for the word of God. And then Monday morning and, you know, just like the, the zeal's like, you know, Thursday night, right? Friday, you know, soul winning on Saturday, you know, we're, we're all proud about what we believe. Then we go out into the world and it's, you know, we don't want to talk about it, right? And, you know, you don't have to turn there. Many of you know it. 2 Timothy 3, 12 says, Yea, and all that live will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You're going to suffer persecution. People are going to think it's weird on, you know, what you believe. And somehow they're going to be offended just by what you believe, right? And like I said, don't be a jerk about it, but you need to stay on your ground, Amen. right? How are you going to go through the great tribulation, how are you going, how can you say, because I'm sure if we asked everybody tonight, hey, are you ready for suffering for Christ? Are you willing to die for Christ, go to prison for Christ? I'm sure we'd all say the same thing Peter did and Paul did. I'm ready, right? But, you know, how can you expect to be ready for dying for Christ if you, like, you know, you stick your head in the sand when people ask you the kind of music you listen to? Yeah, right. right? Think about that, right? It's just a thing we like to say sometimes, like, oh, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready for the, for the Great Tribulation. And you know what? We should be. But, you know, if, if, you, if, you would, if you're ashamed in the small things, how are you going to be ready to suffer for Christ in, in the Great Tribulation or to die for Christ, right, if, if you needed to? We're going to go through persecution and tribulation eventually. Might as well get ready for it, right? So... We talked about, we're talking about how to watch and pray tonight, right? We talked about to watch and pray, we must pray the right way. We talked about how do we pray the right way. We pray, we put God's will before ours, and we spend time in prayer. And then we talked about we, to watch and pray, we must deny the flesh. We looked at the two main things that the flesh will do to you. It will stop you from doing what is good. God wants you to do this. God wants you to do that. The flesh is going to stand in your way. The second thing the flesh is going to do, it's going to make you sin. It's going to lead you into a life of sin. Obviously, by doing that, stop you from serving God. But right before we end the sermon tonight, I want to ask us a que everyone a question tonight. Why watch and pray? Why watch and pray? What, what's, the, what's the big deal? Look at Matthew 26, verse 42. 
Matthew 26, 42. We're all done. I just kind of want to leave you with just kind of the main idea of the sermon tonight. Matthew 26, 42. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again. Isn't that sad? He doesn't even, he doesn't even wake him up. He doesn't even wake him up. Just goes and prays again, alone. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. And then cometh he to his disciples. So this is the third time he's coming back. He's told them numerous times to watch and pray. Numerous times he's begged them to watch with me, watch with me, watch and pray. And saith unto them, notice the change of what he says this time, sleep on now and take your rest. Sleep on now. He's trying to get him to wake up for the past three hours. He's been trying to get him to wake up and pray and now he, just, he tells him the exact opposite. He just tells him to keep sleeping. Take your rest? What? I thought we were supposed to be watching and praying. Take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. I want you to notice that Christ starts out by telling them, over and over, watch with me, watch with me, watch and pray, watch and pray. But the third time, eventually, he just says the opposite. You say, why? Well, let me explain a, a certain theme we see throughout his ministry, okay? There's a theme in the Bible that Jesus' time has not yet come. John 2, 4 says, mine hour is not yet come. John 7, 8 says, my time is not yet full come. John 8, 20 says, his hour was not yet come. That's just to name a few. His time to die, when he was in the garden, when he was telling them to watch and pray, his time to die, it was getting close, but it was not yet. His time was not yet come. So he was telling them, so his time to die was not yet come, but the disciples' time to watch and pray was then. That was their time. That was the time they had to watch and to pray. It was now. And, you know, I'm sure the disciples eventually heavily regretted not, not watching and praying, right? Because they didn't always have the chance to watch and pray, right? He, he says watch and pray, watch and pray, watch and pray, but then it's too late. He's taken by the multitude. You know, I'm sure Peter, the, if you remember the chapter, he goes and he ends up denying Christ. And it says he went out, uh, in verse 75, he went out and wept bitterly, right? I'm sure Peter, as he was walking out, weeping bitterly, I'm sure he would have given anything to be back in the garden and prayed with Christ, and had one more chance of doing it right this time. I'm sure he would have given anything just to be back and to pray with Christ for those three hours, right? I'm sure he would have just given anything just to have one more chance at doing what Christ begged of him. I'm sure John, when he was standing at the cross, watching Jesus be crucified in front of his face, I'm sure he would have given anything to be back in the garden, pray with Christ, listen to what, when he said, watch and pray, have one more chance watching and praying, right? Look, do you realize that one day it will be too late for you to watch and pray? Do you realize that one day you're saved, so you're going to stand before Christ, and you're going to see the, you know, the people you could have gotten saved, you know, most people in here are a soul winner tonight, but you'll, you, maybe you'll see the battles you could have won, the exploits you could have done for Christ, the great things you could have done if you would have watched and prayed. And some are going to be to the point where they give anything to have one more chance to watch and pray. Yeah. Christ, see look, now is your time in the Garden of Gethsemane where Christ is begging you to watch and pray. Amen. And a lot of people are going to die and get to heaven and they're going to, they're going to be to the point where they give anything to be back on this earth so they could do it one more time and just do it right this time and watch and pray. They're going to, to many people who wish they would have prayed the right way, denied the flesh, and made sure they were ready to suffer, whatever happened. And they're going to wish, they're going to, they, they give anything to be back and do it again. But Christ is going to look at them and say, take your rest. It's too late. You're in heaven, might as well enjoy it now. Right? And we're going to have, there's going to be a lot of people who have a lot of regret. 
Because when they have this time on this earth to watch and pray, when Christ is begging you, watch and pray, watch and pray, watch and pray. I know the, the, the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. Watch and pray, watch and pray. A lot of people are just, they, they don't see, they're not just like the disciples. They just, oh, it's just another thing he said, just another thing he said, and they, they're going to die. They're going to, figuratively speaking, they'll be, they'll be standing at the cross watching Jesus be crucified. And, you know, I, I wish I would have watched and prayed. I wish I wouldn't have let the, the Savior who is being crucified me right now pray by himself for hours. I wish I would have done something about that. And we're going to wish we would have watched and prayed. We're going to hear those words, watch and pray, watch and pray, watch and pray. But it's going to be too late. Because look, your time, you know, if, if, you, if there's only one thing you get from the sermon tonight, if you're, kind of, if you're on everything I just said and you only remember one thing tonight, Here's the idea I want to get across. Your time to watch and pray is right now. Amen. It's now. And if you wait, and you wait, and you wait, one day it's going to be too late. You're going to wish you would have, but it's going to be too late. So tonight we just need to realize that, you know, these things we talked about, right? Praying the right way, denying the flesh, being ready for persecution, we're not always going to, have the time to do that. One day we're going to be in heaven and we're going to, I think a lot of people are going to have a lot of regret seeing what they could have done with Christ. And we're going to wish we would have watched and prayed. So let's just remember tonight that now, right now, is our time that God has appointed for us to watch and to pray. All right. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this uh, chapter in Matthew 26. Thank you for this story, God. I pray you would help us to watch and pray, God. Not only watch and pray and do all the things we mentioned, but Help us just to realize that one day it's going to be too late. One day we're going to feel pretty stupid and feel pretty foolish, maybe seeing the things that we could have done for Christ, but it's going to be too late. And help us just to realize and just remind ourselves that, you know, I better watch and pray right now, because one day I'm not going to be able to. Thank you for this church, God. Thank you for these people. I pray you would bless the rest of the service, God. Uh, bless this hymn we're about to sing, God, about praying, God, and not taking prayer for granted, and pray you just bless the rest of the fellowship tonight, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.